two apparently normal men. This man's watch is a seconda. It's tested for accuracy and durability, and it costs under 30 pounds. This man's watch tells the month, the year, your blood pressure, and miles per gallon. Why would such apparently similar men choose such different timepieces? Ah, we must examine the owner to see what makes him tick. Seconda, beware of expensive imitations. <laughs> right now at John Menzies, we've got Songs of Love, the fabulous new album from Richard Clayderman, including the themes from EastEnders and the Bretts. Available on album or cassette at just £5.49. John Menzies. We've got it. like an angel. You get oh. more from a birthday oh. greeting made by phone. Oh. Mm. Your grandma's very happy. <laughs> British Telecom. It's you we answer to. Buying a TV or a video? What if it breaks down? How soon will it be repaired? At what cost? But now there's a great way to buy from Vision Hire. Vision Plan. With small regular payments and all the benefits of the Vision Hire rental service, which means repairs within a day at no extra cost, and after three years, the set's all yours. You can even extend the service cover. So with Vision Plan from Vision Hire, you can have your cake and eat it. Bird's trifle. Doesn't every family deserve something a little bit special? Pick the star you want to see in next Friday's film choice on Scottish. It's your choice between these three major Hollywood stars. Barbara Stanwyck in Cattle Queen of Montana. David Jansen in Swiss Conspiracy. Michael Caine in Marseille Contract. Register your vote by ringing your star's number. It's your vote that counts. For your film choice on Scottish, phone 041 248. Then for Barbara Stanwyck, 4141. For David Jansen, 4242. And for Michael Caine, 4545. To know that your choice for this week's star is Doris Day in Jumbo. And the voting is as follows. Doris Day got 6,450 votes, Carl Molden 4,257, and James Brolin came in last at 2,775. Thirty-five people are now known to have died in the London Underground Fire at King's Cross Station, one of them a fireman. Twenty-one others are known to be injured. The fire brigade says up to ten people may still be missing. King's Cross is one of London's busiest tube stations. The fire broke out at the end of the evening rush hour. It started apparently under a wooden escalator near the booking hall. Smoke and intense heat filled the tunnels, and people were overcome by fumes in the main concourse. People with bad burns have been taken to Roehampton Hospital tonight. The Transport Secretary, Paul Channon, has promised a full inquiry into the disaster. There's a special emergency number. It is 01 from outside London, 834-7777. That's 834-7777. The long procession of stretchers carrying the dead and the injured filed out of the tunnels below King's Cross Station for more than four hours. The rescue teams of firemen have had an appalling task seeking out victims in the maze of passageways at London's busiest underground junction, 
where five tube lines meet. They were fighting to save lives amid impenetrable smoke and searing heat. It's thought that the fire broke out in a machine room below escalators on the second level of the underground station, linking platforms with the main ticket hall concourse. It's not yet known how the fire started, but it spread quickly in the labyrinth of tunnels. Survivors say there was no panic among the people below, but they talk of seeing bodies lying face down in the booking hall, seeing men and women with hair burnt off and screaming. The casualties appear to have been confined to those who were on their way to catch tube trains and those waiting on platforms. As far as is known, no one had been trapped inside trains. The dead, the dying and the injured have been taken to two nearby hospitals, St. Bartholomew's and the University College Hospital. Nurses, doctors and other staff have been working themselves into exhaustion, coping with the horrific burns. The scenes inside have been described as well-ordered chaos. The latest reports speak of the deep burns suffered by the victims brought out of the tunnels of lung problems caused by inhaling, inhaling smoke and hot gases. The firemen have suffered casualties themselves. Among the hazards they've had to face was that from asbestos, and they were withdrawn from the station after the fire was brought under control while experts assess the danger. The hardships and the bravery displayed by the 150 or more members of the fire brigade from all over London was taking its toll. The details of their heroism will become clearer in following days. Investigators from the Department of Transport were on the scene quickly to begin the task of discovering how the fire started. About half an hour ago, the last casualty was brought out of the tunnels. The police now say that rubbish in a plant room underneath the wooden escalator may have been ignited by a spark from the escalator. That's the best evidence so far. Now to Anne Lucas who's at King's Cross for the latest, Anne. Alistair, the latest is that the firefighting crews have been withdrawn from underground because there's a danger of asbestos contamination in the atmosphere. They say they're satisfied that all casualties and bodies have been carried out and it is safe for them to withdraw while experts check the atmosphere. Once they're sure that it's safe for them to return, they will continue to search the underground tunnels. We understand, Anne, that trains have still been running in the underground tunnels through the night. The press haven't been allowed underground yet. Certainly the overground trains from King's Cross are running apparently as normal. The station concourse appears to be quite normal when you walk through it. Although, again, I think it was reported that there was a danger of King's Cross station itself above ground catching fire. Yes, I've spoken to people who are waiting for trains to the north of England who saw billowing smoke coming up from the escalators and they ran frightened for their own safety. They said they were not given any guidance, they just ran out of their own panic. Thank you, Anne. The Transport Secretary, Mr. Paul Channon, has been to King's Cross. He said there would now be a full inquiry into what had happened. But obviously this is a major uh, disaster and we shall have to conduct a serious inquiry. I mean, I'll have to decide that in the morning. Has work started on it already? Yes, my inspectors are here. What's your impression of how the evacuation and emergency procedures were followed? Well, I, the emergency services appear to me to have acted magnificently, and everything that could have been done was done in this tragic situation. How much have we did talk to eyewitnesses, Mr. Channon, we did talk to eyewitnesses who said they'd heard firemen coming up saying what they desperately needed was maps of what, was, what it was like underground, and they were handicapped because they had no instructions. Well, all those are the sort of things that we'll have to go into tomorrow. I mean, it, you know, at this stage, after an incident like this, it's extremely silly of anyone to comment we know a little bit more about it. I mean, if there are any cases like that, obviously that's something to be examined later on. But I mean, there will be a full inquiry into all these matters. Relief teams of firemen got to King's Cross just before midnight to carry on the search underground through the night if necessary and asbestos permitting. All the London emergency services had been briefed of what they'd do in such a disaster. John Snow saw how they reacted to it tonight. Within minutes of the first alarm, University College and Bath's hospitals cleared wards and called in literally dozens of emergency personnel, from plastic surgeons to nursing auxiliaries. Two hours after the disaster, they detailed the treatment casualties were getting. They're getting intravenous fluid in terms of plasma and, and other similar uh, fluids, and those that needed to getting support for their respiration in terms of oxygen and so on. And uh, two patients uh, are needing intensive care and, and, uh, and are on ventilators. Will you later be treating them with plastic surgery? 
There's no doubt that a number of these patients, and perhaps all of them, will need some plastic surgery, some of them probably very minor degrees, some much more extensive. At King's Cross itself, part of the battle was to control the surface turmoil at this hectic junction. Military police supplemented the Met. Three hours after the disaster, the chances of finding anyone else alive in the gutted concourse below was assessed as bleak. Well, people have been horribly burnt. Um, a number of the, well, you'll appreciate, that those bodies that we, we have uh, recovered uh, have got substantial burns. Have you given up hope for anybody who is still down there? Uh, I'm, I'm quite sure that uh, no one else uh, uh, who remains down there is alive. With 150 firefighters battling below, 15 more teams were brought in to spread the search for casualties further. The picture below at midnight... The timber escalators that go down to the Piccadilly line are thoroughly burnt out on the top two-thirds. The bottom third looks untouched, but the concourse and the subway areas from the escalators are thoroughly damaged by fire, severe damage. What were conditions like for the rescue crews that went down there? Totally smoke blocked. Tremendous heat. Um, they took severe punishment in trying to carry out their rescues. First impressions tonight, London's emergency services worked to and beyond the call of duty. John Snow, ITN, Central London. A passenger on a tube train which ran straight through King's Cross said that as they approached the station, they hit a cloud of smoke. He said, I could hear people screaming and running in every direction. Another passenger said staff at King's Cross didn't react quickly enough to the fire. He told Independent Radio News that people were allowed to go into the danger area. And I could see the reflections of flames on the left-hand escalator as I was coming up. I was astonished they were still allowing people up these escalators. They told us that we have to keep going and keep running up. When I came to the top, the thing that astonished me even more was that uh, the staff were allowing people through the barriers and that there were also policemen at the top of the stairs and people were still being allowed down onto those platforms. 35 known to be dead at King's Cross. That's it tonight. Good night. And now to end viewing tonight on Scottish Late Call from Christine Davis of the Society of Friends, Dumblane. <laughs> My picture tonight has a lot to do with Elizabeth Fry, yet it's not of her nor of a prison. When we think of that amazing woman, we almost always have a mental picture of her behind bars, visiting women in Newgate or inside some other dank prison. But her work went more widely than that. Here we are aboard ship with prisoners who were being transported to Australia. For 25 years, Elizabeth Fry visited every ship which left for Botany Bay carrying women convicts. There were 106 of these ships and they carried 12,000 convicts. Something was done for each one of these people. The physical conditions of the voyages were improved. Convict hulks never became luxury liners or anything remotely like that, but at least manacles were removed from prisoners and they were allowed to come on deck once out of sight of land rather than being barricaded in the hold for the whole length of the voyage. Each woman received a bundle before she left, the bag of useful things of my picture, which contained a great variety of craft materials, a thimble, a pair of scissors, a pair of spectacles, bodkins and sewing needles, 100 of them, two pounds of patchwork pieces, pins, sewing cotton and hanks of embroidery thread, as well as practical items like aprons and a cap and spiritual sustenance in the form of a Bible. The idea was that the time on the ship could be spent making a patchwork quilt. The quilt making was time consuming and could be a community activity. Quilts could then be sold to allow the individual to have some money on landing in Australia. Many of these women would be going out to serve time as indentured servants. A well-made quilt could act as a kind of reference and help a woman to find a good place for her time of unpaid servitude. 
and a quilt could always serve the purely practical purpose of keeping her warm. So this picture records a piece of practical philanthropy, giving useful things to people with nothing. It also illustrates some of the other features of the whole tapestry scheme I'm involved in. Look again at these pictures of the useful things here at the bottom of the panel. They show us the whole bag and some of its contents. Patches, thimble, needles, pins, threads, as well as a complete quilt being sold. But they have been drawn and worked by children. This embroidery is not the work of experienced needlewomen who have been sewing as a hobby for years. It's the work of a community which includes children who have contributed drawings and stitches and who have learned about their history in the process and about their vital place in our gatherings. Men who hadn't threaded a needle before have learned to sew, to set a few stitches in a panel, and some have even completed whole pictures themselves. Many who have not sewn have done research or provided transport for a panel on its embroidery frame or given house room to a sewing group. And this picture here has traveled furthest of all. For just as it depicts work done for and with people going to Australia, the panel itself went to Australia to be sewn. Who knows, maybe some of the stitches were worked by descendants of people who had themselves made quilts or slept under quilts made on one of these long ago and far off convict ships. Again, the picture is talking to us about caring and community and sharing and giving a little bit of human dignity to each other. It's a lesson we all need to be reminded of, isn't it? These women who went to Australia as convicts, landed to be servants, nannies, milkmaids, all had to go into unpaid service to work out their term of imprisonment. After that, they were free and some would come home, but many would stay in Australia to be part of the founding of that country. Perhaps we owe more than we know to the little bit of dignity that was handed to each of these women as she was given her bag of useful things before setting out for the other side of the world. Thursday evening on Scottish. I think I've got flu. Flu, do me a favor. Why, what do you think it is? Can you stand the truth? Yes. Malaria. <laughs> Thursday evening on Scottish. And that look at Thursday viewing on Scottish brings us to the end of programmes tonight. And the time now is just coming up to 12 minutes past one o'clock. And tomorrow all programmes are as billed in TV times, except that with an extra cartoon at 1.55 in the afternoon. Scottish Questions will be five minutes later than advertised at 10.35 and America's Top Ten will also be five minutes later at 11.20. We'll be on the air again at 9.25 in the morning following TV AM, but until then, from all of us here at Scottish Television, a very good night to you.
for some Wednesday late night listening, tune into Radio Forth now if you're in the Edinburgh area, where Tom Wilson brings you five hours of music in nightclub. On Radio Clyde now in the Glasgow area, Jim Walk brings you Kinda Blue till two, and then Nighthawk with music and features through the night until six in the morning. That's Wednesday night listening on Radio's Forth and Clyde. Just our usual reminder, if you're off to bed now, please remember to switch off your television set. Good night. <laughs>